Welcome everybody to the Texas RIAs. The Texas RIAs is the largest by far network of real estate investor associations in the great state of Texas, over 150,000 members and participants and attendees going back all the way to 2003. And real estate investor associations, they say if you have the slightest interest in real estate, what do you, what do, you do? The first thing you should do is go join your local real estate investor association because that's where you get plugged in to all the resources you need to do real estate investing. That's where you get training and market data. That's where you get your power team. So a bunch of little videos pop up with power teams, resources, contractors, contracts, and everything you're going to need to be a real estate investor. And uh, I'm going to be uh, giving our main presentation tonight. So uh, thank you for coming out. And we're going to have several presentations tonight. But our first presentation is going to be a presentation on what's going on in the real estate market. So we're going to do a market update. And we're going to have a great uh, set of current data that gives you data on what's going on in the marketplace. So uh, let's start the conversation. Um, what's the big story over the last year or so? when it comes to real estate. Interest rates, what changed? What, what happened? They went up, they went up. Okay, so interest rates have changed. They went up uh, compared to where they used to be. Okay, let's do a little audience participation. Uh, I'm gonna give you two choices. Uh, there's no right or wrong answer. I promise these are just opinions. So we're just gonna get everybody's opinion. Who thinks interest rates are high and who thinks interest rates are low? Simple opinion. So let's try to get 100% participation here by a show of hands. How many of you think interest rates are high right now? Who thinks interest rates are high right now? Okay, who thinks interest rates are low right now? Who thinks interest rates are low? Okay, got a lot of highs and a few lows. Okay, uh, my opinion is that interest rates are normal. Okay, that's, that's my opinion. So I have been investing in real estate since 2003. I own about $30 million for the houses in Texas, most of which have a mortgage on them of between six and a half and seven and a half percent to this day, which is by all historical standards, normal. Now, a few years ago, a little, little over a year ago, interest rates got all the way down to 3%. Okay, 3% is not normal. In fact, before that, when was the prior time, before a couple of years ago, that interest rates got down to 3%? When, when did that happen before? When? Yeah, it would be never. Like in your parents' lifetime, in your grandparents' lifetime, in your great-great-great-grandparents' lifetime. It never happened before. When do you think it's going to happen again? I have no idea. Okay, I can't predict the future, but I would guess never. In your lifetime, your kid's lifetime, your great-great-grandkid's lifetime. And the scenario that would have to happen to make that happen again, you're probably going to be more worried about shooting the zombies in the zombie apocalypse than you are going to be worried about interest rates, right? Because I doubt that's ever going to happen, okay? Could it happen? Who knows? Anything could happen. But right now, interest rates are around 6.5%, 7%, which by all historic standards are normal, okay? Now, and personally, I like normal, okay? I like normal. Um, I don't like investing in abnormal. I've been investing in 20 years. Uh, up markets, down markets, sideways markets, high interest, low interest, mortgage booms, mortgage busts. I've, I've, I've been through it all. And I like normal the most of, of all because when things are abnormal, you just you can't count on abnormal. I'll give you an example. I do both residential and do, I do commercial. Now, in commercial deals, syndications, commercial flips are generally five-year flips. Commercial loans are generally five-year loans. Commercial deals are all geared around five years, right? Because people don't want to invest in something for 30 years. Uh, you know, the lenders that do commercial loans are not the big lenders that do the 30-year loans. They're the small local banks that do the five-year loans, right? And they're turning them over, over and over again. So if you're doing a commercial deal, you're buying a property, the goal is probably to sell it or refinance it in five years. That's almost always the goal. People get paid out over five years. Now, a few years ago, uh, multifamily, one of the different commercial assets we invest in, very competitive. In fact, it became hyper competitive. And, and because it was so competitive, you know, people were paying top dollar, right, to buy these apartment buildings, right? And then they were financing them with 3% mortgages. And you know what? Even at top dollar, if you got a mortgage at 3%, you could still collect enough rent to pay the mortgage. 
okay? But now all of those deals are coming due, right? And the people buying the properties now, they're not getting a 3% mortgage. They're getting a 7% mortgage. And the numbers just don't work. Wayne Gretzky had a famous quote, I don't skate to where the, the, the puck is, I skate to where the puck is going, right? So in a, in a, in a five-year deal, you gotta ask yourself the question, what's the world likely to look like five years ago? Well, when people were paying top dollar and financing these deals with 3% mortgages, I said, I'm out. I have no interest in investing in those deals because I don't expect that something that's never happened before in the history of the humanity is likely to continue. I don't think that's a reasonable assumption. Now, right now, interest rates are, by historical standards, normal. And I'm very excited about commercial right now. It's a lot easier to find the deals, and if you can find deals that work at these normal interest rates, the question to ask is, in five years, do you think interest rates are probably gonna be normal, or maybe even a little better than normal, but probably not much worse than normal? I think that's a pretty good bet, and that's why I like normal person. And I gotta tell you, sometimes it's easy to buy and hard to sell. Sometimes it's easy to sell and hard to buy. It's never easy to buy and easy to sell, okay? Uh, but in this kind of a market, it's not that hard to find deals and it's not that hard to sell deals. So it's a great market for being a real estate investor. And we'll get into some of the data and talk about that in, in some more data. Now, going back to interest rates, let's have another public opinion poll. There's no right or wrong answer, so I'd like to get everybody to participate. When interest rates go up, how does that affect home prices? What do you think? So you got two choices, they go up or down. So who thinks when interest rates go up, home prices go up? Okay, who thinks when interest rates go up, home prices go down? Okay, got a lot of downs, not a lot of ups. Um, I would say my opinion is they go up and down. You see, here's what you're gonna learn about interest rates um, and home prices. Home prices actually don't care about interest rates. Home prices care about two things. Supply and demand, purest market in the world, supply and demand. So only in as much as interest rates affect supply and demand will they affect home prices. Now certainly when interest rates go up, <coughs> houses are more expensive, mortgages are more expensive. And because mortgages are more expensive, there's less demand. And when there's less demand, it pushes prices down. So yes, in that way, it's pushing prices down. But remember, supply and demand. There's some other interesting things going on in the market right now. Let me tell you what's going on in the market. Historically, two thirds of the houses that you see for sale in the MLS are resale houses, <coughs> and one third are new construction. Right now it's inverted. Why? Nobody's selling their house. The economy is not so bad, right? In fact, it's pretty decent. By all historic standards, people should be going like this. Honey, uh, let's buy a bigger, nicer house. But they're not doing it. Why are they not selling their houses? Because they got a 3% mortgage and they don't want to give it up and buy a new house with a 7% mortgage. So all of that supply that should be put on the market is actually being held off the market. So yes, there are fewer buyers, but interestingly enough, there's also fewer sellers, right? Which is pushing prices up. Some other things are pushing prices up. In 2002, three, four, five, six, seven, the banks came up with this idea right? Remember they called it subprime lending, right? In order to get a loan, you walked into a bank, you say, I want a loan. Somebody, they'd walk up, they'd hold a mirror under your nose. If they saw fog, you got a loan. That was the loan application. Right up until 2007, when all the banks went bankrupt. Turns out that was a really stupid way to give out loans, right? You know, and well, they were too big to go bankrupt. So we, we bailed them all out, right? And eventually the banks got back into the business of lending. Okay, but when they got back into the business of lending, all these years later and ever since, now what do you have to do 
to get a loan. Turn over your firstborn, fill out an 1,800-page application, submit blood samples, a lot. Money got cheap, but it never got easy. It never got easy. Ever since 2008, it never got easy. And because it never got easy, something happened to the supply. You see, in 2002, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, builders, everybody could get a loan. Anybody could get a loan. So builders are building houses out of the horizon in every direction you can see, as far as the eye can see. And what do they do with all that inventory? What do they do with all those houses? They just gave everybody a loan. You could fog a mirror, you got a loan. So they built bazillions of houses, and they gave everybody loans. And then the banks went broke, and the loans stopped. It didn't slow down, it was like a train hitting a wall. The lending just stopped, right? And there was all these houses and no more buyers. And crash, the market crashed, right? When they finally started lending again, it never got easy. And because it never got easy, we haven't been building enough supply, enough houses. In fact, on a national basis, we are in the middle of a housing shortage. Who's heard of this housing shortage? We actually have 6 million fewer houses than we need for the number of people that need somewhere to live. And everybody needs to live somewhere. And when you have a shortage of houses, what does that do to prices? Pushes them up. And there's one more thing pushing prices up. Let's talk about inflation, right? Why did we raise interest rates? Because of what? Inflation. Now, when most people talk about inflation, they always talk about it like it's this bad thing. Inflation, bad. We need to whip inflation and get inflation under control, right? The inflation is just this terrible, terrible thing. I personally disagree. Personally, I love inflation. I just have another name for it. You know what I call it? I call it appreciation. Same thing, guys, because when the money becomes worth less, i.e. inflation, what becomes worth more? Everything else, <laughs> goods. You want to get your money out of money. You want your money to be in stuff, gold, real estate. All of that stuff goes up, right? The reason it's called inflation is because it costs more to buy a house, a bar of gold, a coin, or whatever, right? And, and, and so you want your wealth. Where do you want your wealth when there's inflation? In assets, in physical stuff. Right? How many of you have owned a house over the last three years? Who's owned a house for the last three years? Nice. Congratulations. You're a lot wealthier than you were three years ago. Right? A lot wealthier. By the way, what if you had five? What if you had 10? What if you had 20? What if you had 200? Then how much wealthier would you be? Okay. You can't go back. You can do anything you want going forward. So another opinion question. Who thinks houses are kind of expensive right now? Raise your hand if you think houses are kind of expensive right now. Who thinks houses are cheap right now? OK, I have an opinion here. And this is where I'm not going to be like in the middle. I think houses are freaking dirt cheap. Oh my god, I can't believe how cheap these houses are. These, they're practically giving them away. These houses are freaking cheap. I guarantee this is the deal of a freaking lifetime. And I'm going to prove it to each and every one of you. But don't listen to me. I want you to all listen to somebody that I know you implicitly trust. I'm, I'm going to ask you all to ask the, the person you trust more than any other person in the world, right, what they think, okay, about the cost of houses right now. So who, here's who I, who I want you to talk to. I want you to talk to future you. I want to talk to you 20 years from now. So I want you to have a little conversation in your head right now with you 20 years ago. What do you think about the house prices back in Dallas back in 2024? And you know what that person is going to say to you? They're going to say, oh my god, do you realize Back in 2024, you could actually buy a house in Dallas for less than $2 million? Oh my God, they were giving them away. Most of the houses that I own today, I bought 20 years ago. 
most of them I bought for 140, 110, 150. Today, most of them are worth 450, 600. I bought a couple that are worth up to a million dollars, right? Now, you know, you can't go back, but I guarantee the exact same Delta, right, now versus 20 years ago, the exact same Delta now versus 20 years from now. Mark my words, 20 years, it's, it's a linear thing. You can go back a hundred years, you know. Real estate, yeah, it doesn't go perfectly straight, but it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. Over time, it's always the same, right? They are giving houses away. When is the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago. When is the second best time to plant a tree? That would be today, right? Mark my words, buy houses now. Hold on to them. Take the key, hand it to a property manager, do what I do, say, I'll see you in 20 years. That's exactly what I did. I just bought a whole bunch of houses, I handed the keys to a property manager, and I said, I'll see you in 20 years. And 20 years later, I go back, and the guy's like, yeah, they're worth $30 million, you owe five, congratulations. The tenants paid off the mortgages, they doubled, doubled, and some of them doubled again, right? So if you're gonna do anything long-term, buy rental properties, I would tell everybody buy rental properties. But going back to interest rates, um, this is an interesting chart. <clears throat> and this is interest rates versus median home prices going all the way back to 1970. So from 1970 uh, up until 1981, uh, interest rates got all the way up to 18%. So for anybody that's belly aching about 7%, how about 18% mortgages? Yeah, that happened. That actually happened. And when interest rates went up, what happened to home prices? They actually went up. Remember, there's things pushing up and there's things pushing down. And when interest rates came down, what happened to home prices? They actually went up some more. And when interest rates went up and down, up and down, up and down, what happened to home prices? They went up some more. Now, there are bubbles. This was a bubble. There was that 2008, 9, 10. Remember that big bubble? That was a big bubble. And there's been a lot of little bubbles, right? But over time, the bubbles level out, stock market, real estate, whatever, right? And so it's not as simple as to just say, oh, when interest rates go up, home prices go down, right? There are secondary and tertiary effects between interest rates and home prices. So it's pushing up and it's pushing down at the same time. And where are we today? I will tell you where we are today. Uh, it's flat. The market is flat. It's going up, it's going down, and it's flattened out. And I'm going to actually um, break it out by city, so I'll give you a lot more data here. Uh, I do want to issue a little disclaimer here. Most of this data comes from the Texas A&M School of Real Estate and a number of online sources. We do publish all of this online. We don't have an agenda. I hope you believe that. We're really not here to sell you something or to persuade you of some opinion. There are a lot of groups out there like the National Board of Realtors. Every year for the last 40 years, they have been telling us the market is gonna go up, right? And sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong. Every year for the last 20 years, we have been doing a forecast and sometimes we say the market's gonna go up and sometimes we say the market's gonna go down and sometimes we say the market's gonna go sideways because we have strategies to take advantage of an up market, a down market, a sideways market. So we're just gonna give you the data, we'll give you a forecast and then we're going to tell you, you know, use your own judgment because you do need to be a student in the market to be a real estate investor. So let's break the market down by location. We'll start with the Texas Roundup. This is the state level numbers. The average house in the state of Texas, 433,000, and it's up one and a half percent, which means it's flat. Really, basically, it's not done anything. The median price house in Texas is 345,000 and it is flat year over year. So there's things pushing up, there's things pushing down. The volume is down, the total number of houses selling is down, but the prices are flat. Now, <clears throat> every neighborhood's a little different. Some are a little up, some are a little down. But uh, going back three years, oh, well, first of all, let me explain this number. This, this, this is arguably, I would say, the most important number on the screen. If you really wanna get an idea of like what's going on in the marketplace, look at the inventory. Uh, so what is inventory? Well, the best way to explain inventory would be this. If you stopped adding any more houses for sale, 
So you get a bunch of houses for sale in the MLS. Stop adding anymore. Just take what we got and sell them until they're gone. And don't add any more for sale. The question is, how long would that inventory last? How long before the shelves are cleared, right, empty? And the answer is we have 4.7 months of inventory. Now, that also is the average amount of time to sell a house, 4.7 months. Some houses more, sometimes less, right? The average is 4.7. Now, let's, let's put that into perspective. What does that actually mean? Well, the saying is that if there's less than six months of inventory, you're in a seller's market. If there's more than six months of inventory, you're in a buyer's market. If there's right around six months of inventory, you're in a neutral market. Interestingly enough, we are in a seller's market. And people don't understand that. And the reason is perspective. Just like people think houses are expensive, just think people think interest rates are high, right? They're comparing it to recent data. Now, a year ago, we had 3.3 months of inventory, which means we had a hot seller's market. Now we have a weak seller's market, but interestingly enough, by all historical standards, it's still a seller's market. Now the volume is down, the total number of sellers is down, but the total number of buyers is down. And because they're both down, the prices are flat. Going back three years, 2021, prices in Texas went up 18% in one year. 2022, they went up another 10.7% in one year. 2023, flattened out. Went way up, went up some more, and then it just flattened out. All right, let's talk about some of the different cities, starting with Houston. Uh, Houston average price house 445, up 4.7% 4, 4, 4, 4. up a bit. Uh, median price three, uh, 350 up 3%. Months of inventory 3. Point, I'm sorry 4.3 months of inventory. Not bad, not as good as it was a year ago. Close sales is actually up. Houston's doing pretty well. Um, some other data points, uh, lease prices. Uh, lease prices are actually up 2.6%. So on the commercial side, so what does that mean? When prices for leases are up, does that mean the apartment buildings are full or they're empty? It means they're full, right? People need to live somewhere, right? And the leases are, the, the, the apartment buildings are full, pretty, pretty full. And it's because people keep moving to Texas. Um, going back uh, three years, um, 2021 prices in Houston up uh, 16% in one year, 2022 up another 10% in one year, 2023, it flattened out, just like the state. So Houston looks a lot like the state of Texas. Uh, and then we have the big D, Dallas. Now, there's a couple of interesting things about Dallas. I don't know why this is the case, but Dallas has always been the bellwether of Texas. I don't understand why. So maybe somebody has a theory, something with the mix of the economy, something. But if you want to see where the market's going, you look at inventory, you look at condos, and you look at Dallas. Dallas is always the first mover. I don't know why. Um, but the average price house in Dallas is 525000 That's not a typo. Second most expensive city in Texas, major city. Uh, up actually 2%. Median price, 410 down 1%. They're both basically flat. Sales is actually up a little bit, up 5% over a year ago. Months of inventory, 39 it's actually the strongest uh, market in Texas in terms of inventory. It's actually a pretty good market, pretty hot market. Not as hot as it was a year ago. A year ago, it was on fire, 2.5 months of inventory. Uh, if you look at the history, uh, leases are flat. Uh, if you look at the history, 2021, prices were up 20% in one year. Uh, so if you had a house in 2021, you did really well. And you did pretty well in 2022 because you got another 15%. Uh, and then 2023, flattened out. It just flattened out, well, up 1%, which I'm going to say is, is flat. Um, what else? Austin. Now, Austin is an outlier. And, and there is something very unique that only happened in Austin. And I'll explain what that is. But the average price house in Austin is $574,000. That's not a typo. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, Elon Musk moved to Austin and... Uh, Apple and Meta and all the high-tech companies, and they all came in with all their high-tech employees, and prices just went crazy in Austin. It's 574,000 uh, down, down 3.4%. Median price, 450 down 2%. So they're both down a little bit. 4.8 months of inventory, similar to the state, but a little weaker. 
But what's the story in Austin? Well, this is the story in Austin, 2021. In 2021, in Austin, Texas, prices went up 29.3% in one year. 29.3% in one year. In 2021, in Austin, Texas, inventory, 0.4 months of inventory, less than two weeks of inventory. In 2021, in Austin, Texas, you would put a house on the market for sale, you would get 11 offers in a weekend. One would win, 10 would lose. The 10 that lost would put an offer on a second house that got 11 offers in a weekend. One would win, 10 would lose. And this happened over and over again until finally the buyers start screaming at the realtors, what's wrong with you? You're giving me bad advice. What do you have to do to buy a house? I need a house to live in. Uh, you're giving me bad advice. I'm not bidding enough to buy a house. And because of all of that, in 2021, that not normal year, in that not normal year, it became normal for people to buy houses at five to 10% above appraised value. The banks, by the way, will not let you buy a house above appraised value. The total down payment plus the total loan cannot exceed even by $1 the appraised value. If you really wanna buy a house above the appraised value, you put your down payment down, you get your loan, and then you pull out a bunch of money on top of that after all the, uh, everything else. And in that abnormal year, it became normal to buy houses at five to 10% above appraised value. 2022 didn't cool off much. It went up another 10.4%. And then in 2023, down 8%. So in most of Texas, prices went up 30% and they flattened out. In Austin, prices went up 40%, they came down 10% and they flattened out. If you bought a house three years ago, you made 30%, congratulations. If you bought a house one year ago, you lost 10 or eight, you know, same thing. Uh, but that was the anomaly that was Austin. And I doubt that'll ever happen again, but you never know, right? It was just a very, very strange year having 0.4 months of inventory. Uh, and then last but not least, we have San Antonio. San Antonio is the most affordable major city in Texas. A lot of investors go there because it's more affordable. Average price house in San Antonio, 376, down 2%, median 320, and that is flat. 5.3 months of inventory, the slowest market in uh, in Texas. Uh, going back in uh, history, 2021, prices went up 16%, 2022 up another 12%, 2023 down 2%, basically, uh, basically flat. So inventory is what we look at, uh, and, uh, and Dallas is doing pretty well. So that's actually a pretty, pretty interesting sign. Condos is another thing, I, I mentioned that, another leading indicator condominium inventory condominiums we call condominiums the canary in the coal mine right the first thing to go down last thing to come back if condos are hot everything's hot if you can sell a condo you can sell anything right there's nothing wrong with condos but it's the it's the it's the most early thing to go down uh first thing to go down last thing to come back is is condos so if you look at the condo inventory it's going to tell you what's going to go with the house inventory the house inventory uh is going to tell you where the market's going right and dallas kind of tells you where those things are going Okay, so where are we going from here? Well, we have things pushing up and we got things pushing down. So what are some of the market drivers? Number one, the economy. Now, again, real estate doesn't really care about the economy, except that, you know, if, if the economy is doing well, people feel a little better and they're a little more likely to buy a house. So it's gonna push things up a little bit. Uh, and then we have consumer confidence. Consumer confidence, interestingly enough, is measured on a scale of zero to 200. I don't know why, but anything over 100, people are confident. Anything under 100, people are scared. Right now, they're right in the middle, 103, just over the middle, right? So there's a little bit of confidence, and that's pushing things a little more up. Uh, we have the unemployment rate. Anything under 5% unemployment is considered solid unemployment. We have solid unemployment, right? Min minimal unemployment. Everybody has a job in Texas, so that's, that's a good thing. They're a little more likely to buy a house if they have a job. Uh, and then we have job growth. We're, we're, we're adding jobs here in Texas, so that's a good thing. Uh, we're creating a lot of jobs. Uh, and then we have the stock market. Now, again, the, st the stock market doesn't, doesn't, doesn't affect real estate directly, but it does indirectly. So as people look at their 401k and they're like, 
how, how wealthy am I, right? They, they, they kind of answer that subjective question based on their 401k. If their 401k did well, like last year it did well, people are thinking, oh, I'm doing pretty well. I, I think I'm more likely to be able to afford a, a, a nicer home. So that's a, a little push up. Uh, and then we have interest rates. And interest rates, obviously, is a push down, right? Houses are not as affordable as they used to be, so that's a push, uh, a push down. House price trajectory is flat. It's not really going up or down. Uh, closed sales trajectory down a little bit, but that's starting to turn, so it's a little push down. Uh, pending sales trajectory, again, flat, uh, so that's not really pushing up or down. Uh, active listings, again, flat. We are adding more listings, so the inventory is growing, but we're kind of just doing it at a pretty modest pace. Uh, months of inventory is actually pretty good, right? We have less than six months of inventory, we're still in a seller's market. Um, housing permits, we're, we, we're, we're issuing more permits, but we're just kind of keeping up with demand. So we're not doing a whole lot there, but you know, there's a little push up. Uh, in migration, now this should be like a triple size bullet. You know, not all these bullets are really the same size. Some of these are big, some of these are little, right? Migration is big. What is migration? Migration is the ratio of people moving in to a place versus moving out. In other words, it's population growth, okay? And everybody's moving where? Texas. Last year, California lost 500,000 people. Last year, Texas gained 500,000 people. Where do you think they went? Pretty obvious, right? Uh, and then there's another 15 million people. We don't know exactly where they went, but I bet a bunch of them ended up here too, right? So we got a lot of people, and we're getting a lot more people, right? People keep having babies and keep moving here and, and setting up camp here, and they all need a place to live. So that's actually a really big one. The, the, the demand is going up a lot. So this should be, you know, interest rate should be a triple size bullet and migration should be a triple size bullet, up and down, right? Construction labor growth, that's another one. Um, what's going on? Contractors are dying, okay? The average general contractor is 58 years old, like 58 and a half, right? And they keep getting older and, and they're just not replacing them. So if you have a teenager, here's some advice. Don't send them to college, buy them a hammer, okay? Seriously make them a contractor. They will make crap loads more money. They will be way happier. They won't have any student debt. Their brains won't get all screwed up in college. I mean, and they're, and they're not gonna have to work for a jerk. And, and it's, just, it's just like a much better life, right? Contractors are making a freaking fortune. You know, I was reading this story about this surgeon who his, his toilet got backed up and so he hires a plumber to fix his toilet. The plumber fixes the toilet, gives him a bill and the surgeon almost has a heart attack. He goes, oh my God, this is just like the kind of a price a surgeon would charge. And the plumber says, yeah, I used to be a surgeon. You know? <laughs> Seriously, contractors are making fortunes, guys. I used to be able to build houses for 100 a foot, and then 120 a foot, and then, and then 150, and then 180, and then it was 200 a foot, and then it was 220 a foot, and then it was like 250 a foot. Now it costs like $300 a foot, and it's all labor. It's all labor, right? And you know, the materials have gone up too, but it's cost a fortune, right? So that's, uh, that's a, a, an issue. Uh, and then, of course, we have some wild cards. You know, uh, there's an election going on, right? There's a couple of wars going on. Who knows where inflation's going next? And interest rates, you know, the current thinking is interest rates are probably about to change. In fact, all the experts say probably next month, right? And if interest rates cut, uh, that kind of removes uh, one of the remaining red bullets on the slide, right? And that's going to be very interesting. So opinion time, we're going to ask everybody's opinion. What do you think, guys? Who thinks prices are probably going to go up from here? Prices are probably going to go up. Who thinks prices are probably going to go down? Okay, no, no right or wrong. Uh, no right or wrong. I'll give you our forecast. Um, and we've been doing a forecast, by the way, for 20 years. And the forecast has usually been, like, spot on, by the way. And I'm not saying because it's, we're geniuses. And by the way, this is not my forecast, okay? I'm just reporting the forecast. I didn't come up with all this data. Uh, we do publish this. We tell you where we get it. You can go back and, and get the data yourself if you want. But the forecast we've always done for the last 20 years, I'm going to tell you it's always been pretty darn accurate. And I'm not saying it's because we're smart. I'm going to say because this is easy. Okay? Trying to predict the economy 
I think that's really, really hard to do, really hard to do. Trying to predict the stock market, I'm absolutely certain that is not possible because you're betting against speculation. Trying to predict real estate, not that hard. And the reason it's not that hard is because we know almost everything we need to know. We know exactly how many houses we have. We know. We know how many people are getting born. We know how many people are dying. We know approximately how many people are moving here, right? We know how many houses we have. We know how many houses we need. We know how many houses we're building. We know how many houses we're going to need. We even know how many houses we're going to have. We know almost everything okay, when it comes to the supply and demand. There's a few little things we don't know. I don't know exactly what's going to happen with interest rates and some of these other things that affect it a little bit up and a little bit down. Um, but I'll tell you our forecast. Um, the bottom of the market was probably about six months ago. So if you're all sitting around waiting for the market to bottom out, that was probably it. Nothing really happened. Uh, what is our forecast going forward? Nothing's probably going to happen. Um, there's not a lot of exciting things from a supply and demand perspective that are going to push the market dramatically. We do expect interest rates will probably drop, probably by half a point before the end of the year. And that's backed up by the Fed projection and, and many experts' projection. That should give the market a modest boost. That'll give it a little juice, but not much. Right? The economy's not that great. The economy, what's going to happen at the end of the election, who knows? Um, but based on all that, we anticipate sales will be up a teeny tiny bit, maybe 2% by the end of the year. Probably by the end of the year, prices will be up maybe 2 or 